Welcome back to this fourth session of our faith group study, Let the Reader Understand, Making Sense of Scripture. We hope that this background material will help those of you as you're reading through the Bible during our Bibleopoly project this year, but also well beyond that as you continue to read the Scripture. There is, of course, a, a plain sense meaning of the Bible that most any reader can pick up and understand. But deeper explorations of the Bible can really enhance our understanding of the text and the meaning of it. Well, as we turn from the Old Testament to the New, we run into not one, but four accounts of the life of Jesus. These are often referred to as the four Gospels, but that isn't quite accurate because there's only one Gospel, because there's only one Jesus. So it's better to refer to the four accounts of the gospel. And in fact, to this day, most Bibles head the gospels that way. The gospel according to Matthew. The gospel according to Mark. But then the next question that scholars ask is, what is a gospel? I mean, we might say, well, duh, it's one of the four accounts of Jesus' life. That's not so hard. But in a literary sense, the answer isn't nearly that simple. I mean, what genre or type of literature are the four gospel accounts? I mean, the most obvious suggestion would be a biography. And they clearly do resemble biographies, although not in the modern sense of how biographies are written. For example, they're all quite incomplete. There's only a single account in Luke of Jesus' childhood. Mark and John don't include anything about his birth. And they admit that there are all sorts of events that they simply don't write about or include. And it's obvious that the authors are not disinterested or objective observers but they have a stake in the stories they're telling. So then some would say, oh, well, they're more like testimonies then from Christian believers. I mean, Mark makes it clear in the first verse of the first chapter, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then the rest of the book sets out to establish that claim. And yet these aren't eyewitness accounts or personal testimonies. They're writing a life of Jesus. So one scholar, is a, a scholar has actually called these books sermons in story form. And there's some truth to that too. They do preach Christ much as a sermon would. And yet there's so much more than a story. They're rooted in history, especially Jesus' crucifixion, where you find so many details that pin down the story in terms of time and place. And so there are actually many scholars who have made the claim that the Gospels are unique. They don't fit in any other historical genre, at least not well, either in the ancient world or in the modern world. And I suppose that's appropriate, that the Gospels would be unique, since their subject matter is unique. But for our purposes, I think the best way to think about the Gospels is as ancient history. And I emphasize the word ancient because the rules for writing history were quite different in the ancient world from what they are now. And in a way, they had to be. I mean, for example, the resources available to scholars were really limited. All books were written by hand. They were hard to access. Plus, gathering what resources there were was really difficult. There were very few libraries or archives. And what ones they were were hard to access. Research was tedious and time-consuming. I mean, if you needed to know something, you didn't just Google it. Beyond that, there were really no rules for citing or crediting sources. I 
I mean, any nonfiction book today is just full of footnotes and bibliographies. That simply wasn't expected for ancient historians. And so it's very hard now to trace their sources or where they got the information they record. And it was the same with authors. There are some ancient histories that have an author's name on them, but many of them do not. The four Gospels do not include an author's name. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were assigned as the authors very early in the church's history. But the connections to those four are actually pretty tenuous. We still use those names, but mostly for convenience. Truth is, the four Gospel accounts are anonymous. We don't really know who wrote them. But in spite of those challenges for ancient history, authors did the best they could. And Luke in particular describes his process for writing the gospel in the opening verses of chapter 1. He writes, Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. In those verses, Luke gives us a lot of insight into the way that he approached the task of writing an account of the gospel. First, he admits he's not the first. There were other lives of Jesus that he used as sources. He doesn't name any of them and how we wish he would have. Secondly, he notes he's not an eyewitness, but he does have testimony from eyewitnesses that have been passed on to him. He notes that he did all the research that he could when he says, I investigated everything carefully from the very first, that there's a variant that can also say for a long time. I mean, he really worked to gather all the information that he could. And then you have the reference to Theophilus. We don't really know who Theophilus is. But there are two possibilities. One is that Theophilus was a friend or a patron, perhaps the man who paid Luke so that he could do this research and write his account of the gospel. That's most likely. But the name Theophilus simply means one who loves God. So it could actually be Luke's generic name for any of his readers. You who love God, this account is for you. And then finally, Luke notes that his account of the gospel was not written for purposes of evangelism. Theophilus had already been instructed in the gospel and in Christian truth. But this was to provide a more orderly, a more complete account so that Theophilus' understanding would be broadened and deepened. But the key point about ancient history to understand is that it was supposed to be written to persuade the reader. Today we think that history should be objective, arm's length, just the facts, ma'am, a disinterested description, although I don't know how often even modern history is that. But that was not at all the case in the ancient world. The reason one wrote history was to persuade the reader of a particular truth. Now was even the case with secular histories, not just the Gospels. And so at the end of John 20, which is the first ending of the Gospel, there's an epilogue that comes after that. But John writes, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you, dear reader, may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. John wasn't just writing a collection of facts. 
he was writing to persuade the reader that Jesus is Lord. And through that, to be saved by faith. And so a modern New Testament scholar by the name of Mark Allen Powell writes, an objective, dispassionate reception is the last thing the gospel writers would have wanted their books to receive. We're free to reject or accept, to belittle or embrace what they wrote. But whatever our response, we ought to understand what these books intend to do. They intend to convert us. But now if that tells something about the genre or the, the type of literature the Gospels are, we still need to come back to that odd fact that there are four, not just one, in the New Testament. I mean, if there is only one gospel, why include four different accounts of it? Well, on one hand, that's actually characteristic of the Bible. There are a number of places where they include more than one authentic witness. And that rubs us the wrong way. Our tendency is to ask, well, which one's right? Which one is more accurate? What are the facts of the situation? But while the ancient people were interested in facts the best they could get them, they were much more concerned about truth. And whatever would testify to the truth, then the more the merrier. So the church recognized early on that these four accounts of Jesus' life were authentic and inspired writings. You may know that there were many other Gospels written in the early centuries of the church. Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Peter, Gospel of Judas, and many others. But they're very different from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the church recognized that immediately and saw that these accounts were the more authentic writings about Jesus. Beyond that, it's clear that these four writings are interconnected in some very intriguing ways. Today, most scholars believe that Mark was the first of the four accounts of the gospel to be written. Matthew and Luke then both used Mark as a source. They both follow Mark's general outline. Matthew includes huge amounts of Mark's material. Luke doesn't include quite as much, but it's still a substantial borrowing from Mark. But then you can also tell that Matthew and Luke share material in common that's not in Mark. And so scholars believe that they had a, a common source that they shared that Mark did not have. Now, we've never found that source. This is a theory or a hypothesis. And so the New Testament scholars just call it Q. It's from the German word Quelle, which means source, because we know nothing more. It's just a theory that we know they had some shared source of material that Mark did not. Then we also see that Matthew and Luke each have unique material, not in one another's gospel nor in Mark either. So these three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, together are, have been called the synoptic Gospels. Synoptic is a word that means to see together because they tell the life of Jesus in such a similar ways. Now John, on the other hand, marches to his own drummer in all sorts of ways. He has fewer events and miracles, but much more dialogue and long speeches in his gospel. The chronology is different too and sometimes seems a little jumbled. But even there, there are intriguing connections to the other accounts, particularly Luke. And most importantly, we want to say that even though John has a very different character to it, he is clearly telling the same story of the same Jesus. So now, if all four gospel accounts tell the same gospel about the same Jesus, how do they differ from each other in terms of how they present the gospel? Well, there have been many attempts through the years to categorize 
or describe the particular emphasis of each gospel. I mean, here's one example, again, coming from Mark Allen Powell. It says, Mark is primarily interested in Jesus as the one crucified for our sin. Matthew presents Jesus as the one who abides with us until the last day. Luke sees Jesus as the one who liberates the oppressed, freeing the captives. And John sees Jesus as the one who reveals who God really is and what he is like. Well, no, those aren't incorrect in any way. But the problem is that they obscure as much as they reveal. I mean, the truth is that all of those themes that Powell names can be found in all four Gospels to one degree or another. And each of those descriptions tends to lift out one theme from that gospel and to emphasize it perhaps more than it should be. So that rather than trying to boil down some particular emphasis of each of the gospel accounts, it's better just to read them as four takes or four presentations of the life of Jesus. There's another way that the early church in particular tried to describe or categorize the four Gospels. And that is that they connected the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to the four living creatures that surround the throne of God in Revelation chapter 4. There John, likely a different John than from the Gospel, writes, around the throne and on each side of the throne are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second like an ox, the third with a face like a human face, and the fourth like an eagle. Well, St. Jerome in the late fourth century then tied those four living creatures to the evangelists. Said the go Matthew's gospel account begins with the incarnation, so his symbol is the human face. Mark starts with John the Baptist, a voice crying out in the wilderness, as solitary and powerful as the roar of a lion. Luke stressed the theme of sacrifice. So the ox was assigned to him because the ox was often a sacrifice in the Old Testament. And John soars to spiritual heights. And so he was connected to the eagle. These symbols appear often, especially in older churches, uh, where a lot of uh, statues or carvings or uh, stained glass windows were used to educate the people. But just like those four descriptions that Mark Allen Powell laid out, they aren't all that accurate or helpful. They're not flat out wrong, but they tend to emphasize one small dimension rather than the whole book. So how can we read the four accounts of the gospel? and make sense of them? Well, I think one thing that's really helpful is to take the time to read each one as a unified book. You know, from the early days of the church, for practical reasons to make them uh, more usable in worship, the Gospels have been divided into these short little readings that are called pericopes. But the Gospels weren't written to be read that way. They didn't even have chapter divisions in them. They were to be read straight through, like we would read a biography. And to do it that way, I think, will highlight lots of connections within the text that get cut off and missed when we're just hearing a few verses Sunday by Sunday in church. Secondly, don't try to harmonize the four Gospels or force them into one overall scheme. There is only one Gospel, that's true, but we have four different accounts of it or takes on it or presentations of it. So we can let all four inform one another, but let each one stand on its own as a particular testimony or witness to Jesus. Third, especially with the Gospels, I think it's good to try to find uh, resources 
Bible dictionaries or handbooks or other resources to help understand the culture of the time or the nature of Judaism in the first century or what the political world was like. I mean, who exactly were the Pharisees and the Sadducees within their own time and context? What was the relationship between the Jewish people and the Roman Empire? How does the gospel fulfill the whole story of the Old Testament and God's promises to Israel? Many of those things are assumed by the four evangelists, that their readers already know them, but they're so far removed from us that we don't. To learn more about the background, the culture, the context, can really heighten your understanding of the four gospels. But above all else, Realize that all four gospel accounts drive to the cross. There are some individual events or texts that really can't be resolved until you get to the cross. The, that's the only solution to dilemmas or paradoxes that Jesus presents. And on the flip side, it's only as you realize that the whole story is driving to the cross that it makes sense why the people finally turned on Jesus and killed him. And then again, remember as you read the purpose for which all four of these accounts were written. As John said, they were written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. We don't read the four gospel accounts to find out information or principles for living or good advice. We read them to encounter Jesus and to be converted over and over and over again.